Hi, and welcome to Mrs. Pam Reads. This is opposite hey, uh, of me. <laughs> anyway, we are starting a new story today. We will be reading Pay It Forward by Katherine Ryan Hyde. And I did put a little... Um, survey out and this is the one that had the majority so um, that's what we're going to read next please remember that you can always um, send me a message or make a comment a kind comment please um, and let me know if you've got a specific book that you'd like to see read on the channel all right so we have a pay it forward this says 15th anniversary edition a novel by Catherine Ryan Hi. We do have an introduction. And I don't know, I guess I should keep track of the time because this is the first one, so I don't know how far we'll go. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> introduction to the 15th anniversary edition. The year was 1978. I was driving my car, an aging, poorly maintained Datsun, translation for younger people, Nissan in a bad Los Angeles neighborhood late at night. I was alone, inadvisable, I know, but I lived in that bad neighborhood, which narrowed my choices. We all have to go home. I got to the stop sign at the end of the freeway ramp at Echo Park Link. I put my foot on the brake and the engine stalled. That might sound unusual to you, but I was anything but surprised. The engine always stalled when I took my foot off the gas. You see, I was young in 1978, and I had this theory when I was young. I thought it was cheaper if you just drove your car and never took it to the mechanic. <laughs> People invariably laugh when I say that, but it made perfect sense to me mechanics cost money. Therefore, you don't go equals you save money, right? It's one of those youthful theories that works really well until the day it doesn't anymore. This was that day. I reached for the ignition to start it up again. And then, suddenly, everything was dark. All the electricity in the car had died. Headlights dash lights out. I noticed the curl of smoke. I almost don't have to go any further for you to know that this is the bad news in my story. Smoke is never good news in driving stories. This particular smoke was curling up from underneath the dashboard on the driver's side. It didn't take a high school graduate or an expensive mechanic to figure out that it was coming through the firewall from the engine compartment and that it would soon fill up the passenger compartment where I sat. I'm sure you know, whether you've tried it for yourself or not, that when you're driving in a bad neighborhood late at night alone, you feel a powerful incentive to stay in your car with the doors locked. Unless said car fills up with smoke. This has got to be the textbook illustration of being between a rock and a hard place. I jumped out. I looked up to see two men, two total strangers running in my direction very fast. One of them was carrying a blanket. Many thoughts danced in my head. I think the first was, I never made out a will. Then I realized it didn't matter because I had nothing to leave to anybody anyway, except the car, which was on fire. <laughs> Probably other thoughts danced around in there as well, but I can tell you one thought I'm sure did not dance. Rescue. The crazy idea that these men might be coming to my rescue was unfortunately nowhere on the list. One of the men pushed past me and popped the hood of my car from the inside. The other, the man with the blanket, opened the hood 
leaned his entire upper body into my flaming engine compartment and put the fire out using only his bare hands and the blanket. I just want to pause here briefly for emphasis. His bare hands, my flaming engine compartment. Isn't that a fantastic combination between total strangers? I thought so too. Right around the time they put out the fire, the fire department showed up and I have no idea who called them. This was long before the age of cell phones, 1978. This was back when we had emergency call boxes on the highway. I guess we still do, but we ignore them because we have cell phones. Apparently someone going by on the freeway behind us had seen the trouble I was in and stopped to call the fire department. And I must say, who wouldn't? Most of us would do that much for anybody we see, right? I certainly would call the fire department for a stranger, but I would lean my upper body into their flaming engine compartment and put out their fire with my bare hands. But would I? Would I? That, of course, is the pivotal question. By the time the fire department arrived, there wasn't much left for them to do. They had just helped us push the car over to the side of the road and they showed me how the fire started, which was not all that interesting. Then they explained what would have happened if it hadn't been put out, which was not good, but it was interesting. You see, though we don't like to think in these terms as we drive, and I'm not suggesting you do, a car is put together much like a Molotov cocktail. It's a big container of flammable liquid with a fuse, fuel line running into it. Light the fuse and there will be trouble. The only real difference is that you don't pick up the car and throw it. Oh yeah, and standing by the car once that fuse is lit is also not a great idea. That's when I realized that these two men who I thought were standing behind me may have saved more than just my car. They may have saved my life, or at least saved me from serious injury. And they may have put their own lives at risk in doing so. I turned around to thank them and discovered they had already packed up and driven away. While I had been talking to the fire department, they'd left, and I hadn't known it. I hadn't even said thank you. This was the biggest favor I'd ever received and from total strangers. I knew I would never see them again because LA is not that small a town. So what do you do with a favor that big if you can't pay it back? I've had many people ask me in response to that story, so you're saying that if you hadn't stopped that night, the whole pay it forward thing never would have happened. And I say, I'll take it a step further than that. If they hadn't left without saying goodbye, there would never have been a pay it forward novel. And if there had never been a pay it forward novel, there would never have been a pay it forward movie, foundation, or movement. If those two strangers had stayed around to absorb my gratitude, I might simply have gotten their names and sent them a holiday card every year for the rest of our natural lives. That might have felt like enough. But they left without saying goodbye. Amazingly, I was able to get the car fixed. Yes, I broke my own rule and took it to a mechanic. Then I went back to driving the freeways all day long, but something had changed, me. Suddenly I had one eye on the side of the road looking for someone broken down or otherwise in trouble. 
I knew that when I saw such a person, I would stop. And of course, I did, even though I never had before. That one act of kindness changed me. Acts of kindness change people. Small acts of kindness change people in small ways. A big enough act of kindness can alter the course of a person's life entirely. But big or small, I've never seen it fail. Years later, I got serious about becoming a writer. And a year or two after that, pay it forward, got serious about becoming a book. It became a movie that the same year the book was published, it became the Pay It Forward Foundation within the year, and it became a movement almost immediately, but a small movement at first. It never really got huge, but it never went away either. I'm often asked if I had any idea that people would really pay it forward. The honest answer is no. I was a new underpublished or author at the time. My big dream was something along the lines of, please let me see it in a bookstore. I did have a wild fantasy, one that I would have been too embarrassed to share with anyone, that people might play with the idea for a month or two before going on about their lives. It was a pipe dream. I never expected it to come true. If called upon to say what I find most surprising about the whole pay it forward phenomenon, it's the fact that over the course of 15 years, it didn't fall away on its own. It didn't lose steam. In fact, it grew. At first, I thought it was the book and movie publicity driving it, reminding people to pay it forward. But every year, more stories of real life kindnesses paid forward are brought to me. There's really only one explanation I can see. Kindness is capable of planting its own roots. In other words, kindness works. Many people say the pay it forward idea is as old as history. I agree and disagree at the same time. Yes, the idea of changing the world through giving is ancient. Of course, I'm not trying to take credit for inventing kindness. My idea was to add a new twist, a way of encouraging kindness to catch on that, to the best of my knowledge, had never been proposed. If you ask someone why, uh, what, what is pay it forward? They'll usually say something like this. You do something nice for someone and then they'll do something nice for someone else. But as you read this book, you'll see there's another layer. There's the exponential math. It, it's really, you do something nice for three people, aha, and then they do something nice for three more people, each. Mm -hmm. My thought was to take the classic pyramid scheme or Ponzi, Ponzi scheme and turn it on its head. Rather than more and more levels of people being drawn in at the base of the pyramid to support the person at the top, the person who starts a pay it forward chain asks for nothing in return. It's the exponentially growing base that receives the benefit, and it just keeps growing. I still believe it can work for the exact reason the Ponzi scheme is destined to fail. The population of the world is not big enough to provide a sufficient number of people to send money to the guy at the top of the pyramid. But exponential kindness can grow as big as it wants because nobody objects to receiving multiple acts of kindness. It can just keep going. So, is it possible that this idea can turn a key and take a world change to a higher level? 
Well, this is the world where anything can happen, but it usually doesn't. But whatever happens with the pay it forward idea, wherever it goes from here, after 15 good years, things can only get better. Kindness will never make the world any worse off than it is now. I think it's important that we not set unrealistic goals for world change. We sometimes feel that if we can't change the world entirely, we needn't bother to change it at all. And no, I don't ask you to believe that pay it forward will change the world entirely. I don't mean that everyone will jump on board and that no man, woman, or child will be left untouched. But what's wrong with a small world change as opposed to no change at all? Or who knows, maybe it will be medium-sized. I don't think it's important that we know how big in advance. We know it will make things better, not worse. So what more do we need to start? As my character, Chris Chandler, says at the end of the prologue, it doesn't take much to change the entire world for the better. You can start with the most ordinary ingredients. You can start with the world you've got. 15 years after the publication of the book, and more than 35 years after the experience, people ask me if the two men who rescued me ever came out of the woodwork to accept my gratitude. The answer is no. Maybe they've never heard the story. Maybe the incident meant more to me than to them and they've forgotten. But I still have no way to thank them and I still feel inclined to pay it forward. Then I'm often asked what I would say if they did. The answer to that question is simple. I wouldn't say much. I would show more than speak. I would show them the original book, the young reader's edition, and this new edition, the movie, the foundation, the worldwide movement. I would show them hundreds, if not thousands of real world stories. Then I would simply say, look what you started. Wow. Okay. Um, I think we're going to stop there. That was a pretty powerful introduction, you guys. <laughs> I got a little like, Ooh. Um, I'll tell you what, we'll do the prologue real quick because it's only two pages. All right, prologue, October 2002. Now, this is not the author, so to speak. This is, we're in character now. This is the story. Maybe someday I'll have kids of my own. I hope so. If I do, they'll probably ask what part I played in the movement that changed the world. And because I'm not the person I once was, I'll tell them the truth. My part was nothing. I did nothing. I was just the guy in the corner taking notes. My name is Chris Chandler, and I'm an investigative reporter. Or at least I was, until I found out that actions have consequences. And not everything huh, is under my control until I found out that I couldn't change the world at all, but a seemingly ordinary 12 year old boy could change the world completely for the better and forever. Working with nothing but his own altruism, one good idea and a couple of years and a big sacrifice and a splash of publicity. That's where I came in. I can tell you how it all started. I start, it started with a teacher who moved to Antiscadero, California to teach social studies to junior high school students. A teacher nobody knew very well because they couldn't get past his face because it was hard to look at his face. It started with a boy who didn't seem all that remarkable on the outside, 
but who could see past the teacher's face. It started with an assignment that this teacher had given out hundreds of times before with no startling results. But that assignment in the hands of that boy caused a seed to be planted. And after that, nothing in the world would ever be the same, nor would anybody want it to be. And I can tell you what it became. In fact, I'll tell you a story that will help you understand how big it grew. About a week ago, my car stalled in a busy intersection and it wouldn't start again, no matter how many times I tried. It was rush hour and I thought I was in a hurry. I thought I had something important to do and it couldn't wait. So I was standing in the middle of the intersection looking under the hood, which was a misguided effort because I can't fix cars. What did I think I would see? I'd been expecting this. It was an old car. It was a good one. It was as good as gone. A man came up behind me, a stranger. Let's get it off the side of the road, he said. Here, I'll help you push. Well, we got it and, and ourselves to safety, he handed me the keys to his car, a nice silver Acura, barely two years old. You can have mine, he said. We'll trade. Wow. He didn't give me the car as a loan. He gave it to me as a gift. He took my address so he could send me the title. And he did send the title. It just arrived today. A great deal of generosity has come into my life lately, the note said, so I felt I could take your old car and use it as a trade-in. I can well afford something new, so why not give as good as I've received? That's what kind of world it's become. No, actually it's more. It's become even more. It's not just the kind of world in which a total stranger will give me a car as a gift. It's the kind of world in which the day I received that gift was not dramatically different from all the other days. Such generosity has become the way of things. It's become commonplace. So this much I understand well enough to relate. It started as an extra credit assignment for a social studies class and turned into a world where no one goes hungry, no one is cold, and no one is without a job or a ride or a loan. And yet, at first, people needed to know more. Somehow, it was not enough that a boy, barely in his teens, was able to change the world. Somehow, it had to be known why the world could be changed at just that moment, why it could not have changed a moment sooner, what Trevor brought to that moment, and why it was the very thing that moment required. And that, unfortunately, is the part I can't explain. I was there. Every step of the way, I was there but I was a different person then. I was looking in all the wrong places. I thought it was just a story and the story was all that mattered. I cared about Trevor, but by the time I cared about him enough, it was too late. I thought I cared about my work, but I didn't know what my work could really mean until it was over. I wanted to make lots of money, I did make lots of money. I gave it all away. I don't know who I was then, but I know who I am now. I'm getting teary-eyed. Trevor changed me too. I thought Reuben would have the answers. Reuben St. Clair, the teacher who started it all. He was closer to Trevor than anybody, except maybe Trevor's mother, Arlene. And Reuben was looking in all the right places, I think. And I believe he was paying attention. So after the fact, 
when it was my job to write books about the movement, I asked Ruben two important questions. What was it about Trevor that made him different? I asked. Ruben thought carefully and then said, the thing about Trevor was that he was just like everybody else, except for the part of him that wasn't. I didn't even ask what part that was. I'm learning. Then I asked, when you first handed out that now famous assignment, did you think that one of your students would actually change the world? And Ruben replied, no. I thought they all would, but perhaps in smaller ways. I'm becoming someone who, who asks fewer questions. Not everything can be dissected and understood. Not everything has a simple answer. That's why I'm not a reporter anymore. When you lose interest in questions, you're out of a job. That's okay. I wasn't as good at it as I should have been. I didn't bring anything special to the game. People gradually stopped needing to know why. We adjusted quickly to change, even as we rant and rail and swear we never will. And everybody likes a change if it's a change for the better. And no one likes to dwell on the past if the past is ugly and everything is finally going well. The most important thing I can add from my own observation is this. Knowing it started from unremarkable circumstances should be a comfort to us all because it proves that you don't need much to change the entire world for the better. You can start with the most ordinary ingredients. You can start with the world you've got. Okay, that is definitely enough for the first time. Woo, I'm on an emotional roller coaster already. And I know the story. It's just been, it's been many years um, since I've read it or seen the movie. But anyway, all right, so, Next video, we begin the actual story story. All right, you guys, I hope um, you enjoyed that. Sounds like it's going to be a wonderful book. Maybe we can get the, the movement going again. That would be so cool. I mean, it still goes, you know, at a small, a small portion, but maybe this will, will revamp it. All right, you guys, I do because it's a new book. I want to remind you, click the subscribe button and it, oops, sorry. And if you do, you want to click on that little bell tab and that way you will get a notification every time a new video posts. I appreciate you joining me. I hope you will come back for more of Pay It Forward by Katherine Ryan Hyde. All right, you guys have a wonderful day and I will see you next time.